Okay, so I want to take this opportunity to, so I'm a clinical geneticist, I see patients, I basically look up um, every diagnostic report I get, I end up looking up the variant to see if it's a nomad, even if it tells me what's going on in the report, just because I think there's a lot of extra features in NOMAD that can really help with interpretation. And so I just wanted to walk through what NOMAD is, why we need reference databases, and some of the many features that we have on, on the database. Um, and also thought this would be a good introduction because the MPG following this will all be about the NOMAD data set. So there are 7.5 billion people on the planet at present, growing numbers, and given the size of the human genome being about 7 billion bases, then there should be enough people around and mutations arising that we should be able to see every possible single base change that's compatible with life existing in a living human. So there's huge amounts of variation we should be able to capture by sequencing everyone on the planet. And so we haven't gotten that far yet, but we're making some progress. And so we, one of the things is a lot of the data gets sequenced in different places, and so it's been really important to bring it together and harmonize it to have data sets that sample a lot of the human variation. So we're doing a lot of variant aggregation at the Broad Institute and really leading in this area. And so this is all work that was started by Daniel MacArthur and has been carried, being carried on by the team. So the first release was in 2014 with the Exome Aggregation Consortium, or EXAC, which had 60,000 exomes and was an order of magnitude larger than the previously available reference population databases and really became the gold standard kind of overnight in the field. Um, this is the graph showing you the usage of these databases over time. And you can see right when it was released, it was, like everyone was checking it out. It was um, a really hugely needed in the field for a long time before we had it. This was followed in 2016 with the release of the Genome Aggregation Database, or NOMAD, which is our main data set today. Uh, it has 125,000 exomes and 15,000 genomes. It was our first data set that had both exome and genome data. It was still build 37. And then very recently, last October, we released the NOMAD V3, which is a new data set of 70,000 genomes. It's actually natively mapped and called on build 38 of the human genome. Um, and so is the, the first like uh, of the NOMAD data sets that's released on 38. So you can see that there, the data set gets a wide use from over 184 countries, over 20 million page views, and we think that it's been used in every diagnostic pipeline to diagnose both research and clinically patients with rare disease. Um, basically, every data set gets annotated with the NOMAD frequencies, and so it's been hugely powerful. So it only exists because of 143 PIs who agree to share their data into the data set. Most of this data is actually sequenced at the Bro and with the, at the genomics platform here. And then we've really relied heavily on close work collaborations with the Bro Data Sciences platform and the Hale team as to be able to aggregate and call this much data together in one unified call set has required a lot of innovation in the algorithms. So who's in the NOMAD database? We often get asked if this is a control database of 140,000 entirely healthy people. It is not. If anyone knows where any of those people are, let me know, because we all have different health problems. So these, the, the data sets where we, where, that we include are case and control studies of complex adult onset disease, so things like type 2 diabetes, heart attack, migraine, bipolar. But we don't include data sets that are recruited for more Mendelian conditions, particularly pediatric onset conditions. So we wouldn't take rare disease cohorts. We don't have any autism cohorts included. We wouldn't take cardiomyopathy cohorts as we're trying to not inflate the, the allele frequencies in the data set. We also don't take the parents from those studies because that would also increase carrier frequencies. It's depleted as much as possible of people known to have severe pediatric disease, as I just said. Um, and it's about 55% male, so pretty evenly male and female. And the mean age of individuals is 54 years, but there are some people who are recruited under 18 into the data set. So we, it's a whole range of ages. We have we have relatively good ancestral diversity in the data sets. This is an area where every data set, we would love to have more ancestral diversity, um, but we do have the, like five sort of continental populations rep represented here. We do see a huge over-representation of European population. Um, and then the subpopulations we've pulled out separately are Ashkenazi, Jewish, and Finnish because of some of the um, sort of founder variants in those populations, and it's helpful to have those separate. 
So you can access the data through a, a large VCF, a, like a huge VCF that you can download that has a site's alleles frequency for each position. Um, but the way I normally access the data is through the Nomad browser, which is really a really handy website-based tool where you can enter any gene and you can look at your all the variants of interest. I'm going to briefly introduce the site. I will say I have an MPG primer before that I put the link up there that actually goes through a lot of like how to look up a variant and think about a variant that I'm not going to cover most of that today. Um, it also goes through frequency filtering as an approach. And, so, um, and also IGV screenshots, what you should be looking for. So the website for the Nomad browser is there. So if we were to type in the gene NSD1, this is what the gene page would look like. So we have a lot of information on here. Great. Um, so these are in black as the exons of the gene. Obviously, the introns are not drawn to scale here. And then you can see the coverage in blue is the coverage in the exome data. In green, this like really nice flat lines, the coverage in the genome data. The data set is more PCR-free genomes than PCR plus genomes, but it's a mixture data set. Um, we have the number of a histogram of the ClinVar variants that are path and likely pathogenic from a from that database included, which is a database where peop, uh, molecular diagnostic labs and research groups clinically annotate variants to determine, uh, assess whether they think they are pathogenic or for disease or not. So we include that data. Most of these variants are not actually in the NOMAD data set, um, but we list all the pathogenic ones there. And then here is actually just a schematic that shows all the variants that we see in the gene. But the real way we look at that is down here. There's just a list of every chromosome position, ref, and alt, and every variant that we see. Over here, we have the molecular consequence of that as a C dot or P dot nomenclature, whether the variant is found in the exome or the genome data set or both. Um, these are all intronic or 5 prime UTR because I'm just starting at the top of the gene. But if we scroll down, we would get to more missense and loss function and synonymous variants. The number of times we see the variant in the data set is the allele count. So once in heterozygotes and twice in homozygotes, and then the number of homozygotes for each variant, and then along with the allele frequency. So all that data is right there. If we click on any variant on, this, on the list, it takes us to every variant has its own variant page. And it tells you the genome build that it's on. As I mentioned, we have different data sets on different genome builds. It tells you the number of times in exomes, number of times in genomes that it's seen. Gives you the, a little bit of in silico prediction here. Tells you the different consequences in different transcripts. So this, for this variant, it's the same in the two different transcripts for the gene. Um, and then down here is really the heart of the variant page. It's the population frequency. So for this variant that I've selected, it's present uh, in 115 Africans, um, and then also in seven Latino ancestry individuals, along with the allele frequency. And you can see the allele frequencies can vary widely for variants between different ancestry groups. There's also a histogram for the age distribution of carriers of that variant, um, which can be helpful, um, although we don't really rely so much on that. And it can be the age that they were, typically they, they were recruited to the study, but it could be the age of last contact. It's sort of whatever age was shared from the study. Yes? Within the NOMAD v2 data set, if they have an exome and a genome, they're in the genome data set, and we remove them from the exome data set. Uh, we'll talk in the end about the V3 new genome data set. That currently, there is a lot of redundancy with Nomad V2, and we're going to work on a way to, like, you can tell the difference, but we're, and then in the Nomad V4, we, we will, again, make sure we don't have overlap, but um, we wanted to have the genome V3 data set be as big as possible. Um, and then for several ancestry groups, we've broken out sub-ancestries, um, depending on how many individuals we have to, for each group to some extent. And so for European, you can see the groups here, uh, East Asian, um, and we'll continue to refine those as the data set grows. And then for most of the variants, we're, although we're still working on this, and um, we have the actual IGV screenshots of a small window of the reads around that variant, so you can take a look and see if the read data looks clean and if you believe the variant is real. Um, there also is like a QC step that goes in, and so if anything fails QC, you'll, it'll come up up here, so you'll be able to see that. I still kind of, I still sometimes look at a variant that fails QC if I do see it in a patient where it's been saying or confirmed, because if I know it's real in a person, it increases the chance that there's something in, that could be real in the database too. But we have pretty rigorous QC that goes into it, but it's obviously imperfect, and there are real variants that pass the filters, and there are, um, Artifacts, sorry, the real variant. There should be real variants that pass the filters. Good job, excellent. 
Um, but there are artifacts that pass the filters, and there are real variants that fill the filters. It's obviously just a QC process. Um, and then the PopMax filtering allele frequency that we recommend using for filtering is also on each page. So what we really do with data sets like this is we compare one individual's, typically with rare disease, but one individual's exome or genome with this thousands of people for, for comparison to figure out which are the rare variants, which are the very rare variants, which are the variants we don't see in a population this size. And so this just shows you the power of using a large reference database. So this is even just from EXAC when we had 60,000 people. If we just ask how many um, very rare variants, what, less than one in 1,000 people do we see after filtering? When we used the older databases, which were a great start, um, they didn't have as much ancestral diversity, and so they would still leave you with hundreds and hundreds of variants to look at, and there was huge spread depending on the ancestry of the individual's exome you were looking at. Um, but when we are able to use Nomad, which has more diversity and it's larger, sorry, this is again exact, we can take this down to about 150, and we think it would go a little lower even with Nomad. Although the biggest thing that's gonna decrease the number of variants left to look at is not increasing the size so much as it's increasing additional diversity in the data set, so having more populations represented. So there's a lot of tools that have been built off the NOMAD data set to help with, vari with variant interpretation. So we've talked about population allele frequency filters. Um, we also have structural variant population frequencies. I'm gonna to talk today about transcript aware annotation and PEC scores. If a variance is absent from the general population, we do find that interesting, although um, NOMAD only currently captures about 8% of the possible variation in humans, and so there's a lot of variation that we just haven't sampled yet that is gonna be perfectly com compatible with life, um, so there's a lot more to be found there. Um, although we are approaching saturation for variants at CPG sites, so we, we do see over 90% of possible CPG sites in the, in the NOMAD database being variant. Um, and then constraint scores, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. So the idea of constraint is in saying, instead of where do we see variation in the human population, where, do we, where are we missing variation? So this is just showing you exons of a gene. These are the, just the density of missense variants along this gene, and you can see there's some variability to that. And there's these two regions here, and maybe over here, where there just doesn't seem to be a lot of missense variation. And so often when you overlie what's actually going on with the protein there, you'll see that these are important domains that have higher conservation, and that's why we're seeing less, um, we're seeing more constraint, less variation within those regions within the human population. So this is just to, um, to illustrate the idea. This is work by Caitlin Samoha that was done several years ago, where she developed a mutational model to just calculate how many of each type class of variant we should see in the NOMAD database. And then we just basically, we take the expectation that we just see how many we observe and are able to make tables for each gene. Then she's, we've done a number of statistics on this. So for missense variants, she just uses a z-score, so how many standard deviations away it is from expectation. So we tend to say a z-score over 3.1 is significant, although if a z-score is 2.9, I still think that shows some evidence of depletion. Things are still interesting. And so it's a, a pretty continuous metric. For loss of function variants, um, one of the things you'll notice is you expect a lot fewer loss of function variants than the other classes of variation. Um, just So loss of function does correlate very strongly with the gene length. And so you're gonna have better, much better power all of them correlate with gene length, but you're gonna have much better power for genes that are larger than for genes that are smaller, and that power impact really comes into play when you have smaller numbers like the number of loss of function variants you're expecting. So if you were only expecting five loss of function variants, it'd be very hard to show depletion from that. However, if you're expecting about 100 and you see five, that is significant depletion. So we have two metrics that we use. The first that became very popular is PLI. And I'm actually just showing you here the graph for PLI for all the genes that were able to calculate a PLI score and that where the metric behaves well, which is most genes. Um, and you can see that it, it's, it, what it, it's doing this on purpose. It's trying to push things to the extreme. It uses an expectation maximization algorithm. And it's just saying, do things look more like they're haploid sufficient or more like they're not haploid sufficient? And this gives you a good sense of why this doesn't work so well for kind of recessive in the middle where you expect half the amount of loss function variation. Um, it really trying to push things to extreme so that you can use cutoffs, because biologists like cutoffs. And so this is a great metric if that's what you want to do. And we recommend taking a cutoff of PLI greater than 0.9, but you can even go more stringent, um, and you can say PLI greater than 0.98 or something if you were interested. 
But this isn't biology. This is trying to sort of group things. This is more biology. The loss of function constraint is really a spectrum, not a dichotomy. And you're going to have things that are embryonic lethal, that we should never see loss of function variation in the human population. You'll have others that cause hapoinsufficient disease, where you will occasionally see them in the general population. You'll definitely see them in people with um, disease. Then recessive disease that's in the middle, and then more complex disease, and along with non-essential and beneficial genes. So the constraint metric for this was developed by Konrad Karczewski, and it's called LUF, and it's a more continuous metric, as you can see from the graph of the LUF scores of all the genes here. Um, what it does is it just takes the observed over expected value, and, the, and you get a number for that, so like the percent of loss of function that you see, but then it puts a confidence interval on it, and it takes the upper confidence interval to add some statistical adjustment to it. With that, we still see that um, there are many genes. There's still about 3,000 genes that have less than 35% um, expected, observed over expected variation. And still, despite having constraint scores for a number of years now, over 70 of these have no known disease phenotypes. So we think there's still a lot of human biology and disease genes to be discovered. Um, there, there have been, a, like, this has been a class of genes where a lot has been found, but there's still many, many, there are still over 2,000 to, to figure out. Important notes on constraint is it's primarily for dominant disease. I will sometimes hear people say, oh, I, you know, I have, I, I have these two missense variants. There's a recessive candidate, but the gene's not constrained, so maybe it's not important. For recessive, we, we don't see a signal so well, so you shouldn't hold that against your, your analysis. Um, it's also not necessarily a sign of a strong phenotype that a gene is constrained. So something that impacts fertility and gives an evolutionary signature is what we're seeing. And so it can be a mild impact that you can, um, you can see pretty strong constraint. The most extreme being somebody who's like totally healthy, lives a totally normal lifespan, but just is infertile. Like you'd see a very strong constraint score on the, that, a gene that caused that phenotype. Um, and then this selection occurs through reproduction, so the deleterious effect must be during reproductive years. And BRCA1 is the example I always show for this. So we know this is a well-established autosomal dominant breast and ovarian cancer, where um, protein truncating variants or other deleterious damaging variants cause breast and ovarian cancer, and yet we don't see constraints of this, and that's because often the phenotype occurs after reproductive years. Okay, so this is the NOMAD data set, uh, the native NOMAD page again. I'm going to make two changes here to show you the missense regional constraint. Um, one thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to open and show you all the transcripts. Um, and the second is I can change the data set I'm looking at by just up here selecting a different data set. So I've made both of those changes. So I'm now on the XAC page. The constraint table looks a little different because it's the older data. We're not updating it quite the same. And then now you can see for NSD1 all the different transcripts. And we use ensemble transcripts. Um, we are working on supporting more of the, the, the main transcripts where we can uh, match an ensemble transcript to RefSeq. But right now we're using ensemble. Um, and what I want to highlight here is I've now also shown you all the ClinVar variants, but each one individually as a star. In red are, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to. In red are the, the missense variants, and in, sorry, in red are the protein truncating variants, and orange are the missense variants. And one of the things you can see, so this is the area of regional missense constraint here. Um, and so the, this region here has only 4% of the expected missense variation. This region has 25%. And when you look, you can see all the ClinVar missense variants are really building up in that region. Um, the other things, we, whereas the protein truncating variants, as expected, are throughout the whole gene. Um, we also have the expression data. This is all from GTEx, and so you can also change and look at like which transcripts are the most expressed, and you can change to a tissue that you're interested in. So with the constraint, um, so these are all the ClinVar variants. Um, you can see that the, there is fewer missense variants just by eye in, in these regions. Um, and there is this one other missense variant in ClinVar over here, and I sort of wondered, you know, this, this region wasn't big enough or depleted enough to come up in the statistics, but I thought it looked a little depleted, and so I've always wondered about that. We've recently added a new feature on back, I'm going to take you back to the Nomad page, where you can click this box, and you can filter the ClinVar variants that are only, to only the ones that occur in Nomad. And so what I haven't mentioned yet is NSD1 causes a, a disorder called Soto syndrome. So protein truncating variants or haploinsufficiency of this gene results in a severe condition that is overgrowth, but also severe intellectual disability, typically. 
um, although there can be a range. Um, and so we wouldn't expect to see individuals with this condition in the NOMAD data set. So what happens when I click the filter to selected variants in NOMAD? I actually get three variants that are left. They're all missense variants, and I've added arrows here because I know the stars are pretty small. And so what is going on with those? Right now the table below doesn't change, but um, I just pulled the variants, and so two of these are observed in one individual and one is observed in nine individuals. And again, one is this one in this not missense depleted region, but that by eye looks a little bit depleted. Yes? How do we calculate the, the uh, yeah, expected like, loss of function? Like observed five in that column there, right? That's from NOMAD. Right. If you're only showing us three. No, I'm showing you something different now. I'm not showing you any loss of function right now. Oh, is it missense? Sorry. I'm, I'm actually showing you the ClinVar missense variant, the, all the ClinVar variants that are in NOMAD. So it's, yeah, so I mean this, yeah, so I'm, I'll stick with that for now. <laughs> So these are, these are not, these are just saying like, again, I shouldn't expect to see any individuals with SOTO syndrome in the data set. I see three variants that are classified as pathogenic or likely pathogenic for SOTO syndrome in the data set, and that's across 11 individuals. Sort of what's going on there, and how do we look into that? So one thing you can do is if you click on any of these stars, it will actually pull up this page, this, sorry, this little box, it's much smaller when you pull it up, and then you can click right to go to the ClinVar entry, so that's very handy. And so I did that for the, first I'm going to tell you about the, these two variants over here. These are, again, in the missense constrained region, so we're interesting. But these two variants actually were classified by a lab in 2013, long before we had reference population databases, and no one has gone back and looked at them since. So I think it's very possible that, like, with current evidence and current criteria, these wouldn't be classified as likely pathogenic. Um, and that, again, highlights how there are things in the databases that the ClinVar databases are imperfect. There are some incorrect assertions, and it's really important to look at the primary data and think and reevaluate it for yourself. Um, and then the first variant, that one that was over on the left, again, it was in one individual. It was called likely pathogenic by a research lab. Um, and it actually, they commented that this was a, a missense variant that was inherited from someone. So typically, Soto syndrome is very severe and isn't passed on, um, so you wouldn't expect to see it with an inherited variant. So I can't say for sure if this is a hypomorphic variant and that's what they're describing, but I think it's more likely that this is probably a misclassified variant, um, but I, I can't tell for sure. Um, so just that's kind of some of the things you can do with the, the NOMAD database and the clinical variants we see. Oh, the next thing I wanted, so I wanted to get, yes. There's five loss of function variants in NOMAD. Yes. Why are there five loss of function variants in NOMAD? Okay. I will, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that at the end, because we're going to cover more things that are going to help with that, and I will, I will get back to that. Okay. So, so I have this one individual, what's going on with them? I can ask questions about, are they a control in a study that was included in NOMAD? Are they, and so that's the first question I wanted to ask. So I just picked from this subset, I, from this the menu, I just pick the controls, and I click on that, and it takes me to this page that says variant not found. So this variant, this individual who has this variant is not in the control subset. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. They're a case in something. They could totally, it could be anything. I mean, there's many, many phenotypes included, but they're not a control in whatever study they were in. So then I want to ask, so Soto syndrome causes intellectual disability. Maybe they have some kind of subtle, neural, they're in some kind of neurologic cohort, and in some subtle phenotype, and I want to ask about that. Um, so I click the non-neuro, and this is what comes up. This individual is a not in a neurologic cohort. So the fact that they're still here means they're not in a neurologic cohort. So I don't have that many more I can check. I checked non-cancer next, and this individual is not in the non-cancer cohort, so they are in a cancer cohort. And just before anyone gets concerned, why are there cancer cohorts in here? These are germline samples from individuals recruited to studies who, individuals who have cancer, but it is their germline sample that is in the data set. Um, so this individual who, you know, the, so that has this variant, this inclinvar that I think again is misclassified, um, comes from a cancer, is participating in a, in a cancer study. 
that is the, the extent of phenotype information that we have on the individuals in NOMAD. The other thing I can look up um, is the person's age rounded to the nearest five. If I was interested, we actually don't have age for this cohort, so I don't know for this individual. Um, and the other thing I can check is just to make sure the variant looks real, which actually I'm a little more tempted to do if something's in the, one of the um, cancer cohorts just because I, I do worry a little bit about the contamination. And it's actually some of the older data that's in the data set. Um, and so I can look at the depth, which is greater than 100. That seems good. And the allele balance looks perfect. So I think the variant is real. I actually don't have IgV for this one, but there's nothing from the stats that makes me worried. I just wanted to highlight one of the other things you can do if you were to, you know, look for something and it's not there and you get that you can click this view surrounding region and it will actually give you like there are region views on Nomad and so you can both like look at the variants in the region. It does have a table at the bottom that I'm not showing here and we put in features where you can zoom in and out and kind of move around the, the region. Um, and you can do the same thing for um, every gene page has a region view that you can click on and so this is that same NSD1 gene but now the exons and, or sorry, now the introns are to scale, and so you can see, you know, the peaks of exon coverage, and then what the coverage looks like in between, and then like, um, like lots and lots of variants in this gene. But they all load on a giant page that you are able to look through and download if you wanted. So I'm going to talk about structural variants next, and I still will get back to Max, Matt's question on my my next next part, but. Um, so NOMAD structural variant, NOMAD SV, is an open resource of structural variation that was done by the Talkowski lab with Brian Collins and Harrison Brands leading the study. Um, their whole study has about 12,000 genomes, but um, there is an overlap of about almost 11,000 samples with the NOMAD data set. And so the ones that overlap, they have called those variants and released them into the NOMAD data set. So I forgot to put the slide, uh, the, the link on here, but basically when you're on Nomad, and I've been showing you the little box up here where you select the Nomad sub data set you want to look at, right next to it, it says Nomad SV, and you can flip over and look at the SV data set. So it's very easy to access. I'm going to show you this one variant. So this is a structural variant that impacts the gene RBM8A. It causes thrombocytopenia absent radius syndrome, or TAR syndrome, which is a recessive condition where the affected individuals, um, it's like they have thrombo, they have low platelets and they have they have, they have limb malformation, so it's a pretty distinctive phenotype. But the individuals who have the condition typically have a large deletion of one of the uh, overlapping this gene on one chromosome, and then a, a, a point mutation in the gene on the other chromosome. And so actually, when we first had this data set, I had wanted to look up in the literature what the allele frequency was from like literature and see like how it compared with our data set, but actually couldn't find that information in the literature. So it's not something we have good estimates, what is the, about the population frequency um, of this variant. And it, there probably is in large CNV data sets, but I just I couldn't find it reported anywhere. So it wasn't easily accessible to me. And so I, so I went to this gene and I tried to see, do I see the variant? So it's actually this loss, it comes up as loss of function. It's a deletion. These are the coordinates, it's 240 KB. I was like, that looks pretty good, but I'm just looking at this one gene here, and so I can't tell if it's really the right thing. And so if you click on the variant here, it will actually take you, um, or sorry, I think I zoomed out then, and I zoom out and I can actually see um, that the whole, the whole deletion and all the genes it encompasses, um, and I looked at the coordinates and it does match up the, what's been reported in the literature. And then you can click on the variant down here, and you can go to the SV variant page, which also has a lot of information. So it tells you the number of times it was seen, the number of chromosomes assessed, a quality score, so this is very good. Um, and it tells you the size, the type of variant, and then it tells you how this variant was detected. And this one was mostly detected by decreased read depth over the region. Sometimes it has breakpoints and other things that go into it. Um, it tells you the genes that are impacted. And then this is, again, the, the heart of the variant page for any variant. And it tells you it's seen in two Europeans and one African sample. And we do have some, sets of, some subsets available for the SV data set. So you can look at things. So it includes deletions, duplications, um, regions have, that have multi-copy number, insertions, inversions, complex events, and some other. And you can, cl you can color things by this schematic or by just things that are loss of function, um, internal exon duplication, copy gain, or other. So it's a very nice data set. It's also all downloadable, um, but I often, when 
it also correlates very well with the constraint data where we see deletion, we don't see deletions of loss function constrained genes and we do see deletions over some other genes. Um, but now when I have a copy number variant from an array or something else, I'll often come to see if we see it in the general population. Um, and this is another data set that over time will be growing to, to be eventually on NOMAD V3 and have a lot more genomes. Any questions on that before I move on to the next? Um, so this is transcript expression aware annotation that we use to improve our variant interpretation. This is all work by Burrell Cummings. Um, has been presented here before as, as much of the than telling you has been. Um, so this really had the idea of when we see loss of function variants in haploinsufficient genes in the NOMAD database, why are they there? Because they shouldn't be. We sh for severe pediatric conditions, they, we shouldn't see individuals with loss of function variants. And so she looked through uh, about 80 genes and looked at why we're seeing those variants there, if we think they're really disease causing or if something else is going on. And what she found in the majority of cases was it had something to do with the transcript um, and that it actually affected some part of the transcript that wasn't important, which I'll show you in the next slide. Occasionally there were sequencing errors or mapping errors, um, but it was often like annotation was a, a huge issue in why we were seeing these variants. And so this is an, an example of what I'm talking about. So we have this gene, it has a bunch of different transcripts. I'm only showing you a subset of the genes, so there's more variability upstream and downstream. But then we have, in one of the transcripts, we have this exon. And it's not in any of the other transcripts, it's just in this one. And if you had a protein truncating variant in that exon, would it make any difference to the person who had that protein truncating variant, given that it has all the other transcripts that are expressed fine? Is that exon even ever expressed in any context? Is it just something that got annotated um, because it came up in some data sets or somebody thought it looked like an exon? So when we have the, the like what the variant is, whether it's a protein truncating variant or a missense variant, we actually report it, NOMAD reports it, and, and all our, our pipelines in our rare disease data report it as the worst consequence so we don't miss something. Because you wouldn't, if you just reported this, maybe this exon is really important, and if you just reported this as you know, a, an intronic variant, we would never look at it in our analysis. So we report it as the worst consequence it has in one of the transcripts. And in NOMAD, this comes about um, it would be reported, like a uh, protein truncating variant here or missense here would be reported as that. And then it would give a little start saying, this is, or a little cross, saying this is not actually the canonical transcript. And so you might want to like double check and see what it's doing on all the transcripts. But the question becomes like, is this exon important? Because it could absolutely be a very important exon. And so you can't just exclude it because it's not in all the transcripts. So Burrell's method called transcript aware expression analysis estimates the, the expression of each transcript and each exon in each transcript to some extent. It has to account for a number of things. If you just look at RNA-seq reads, there's huge three prime bias because we use poly-A capture in, the, in, in GTEx and much of our RNA-seq data. And so you can't just, um, you know, you worry something over here, you can't just, you have to do a lot of statistical adjustment to, adjust, to take all this into account. There's also mapping biases, the length of the exon matters, and the isoform length. So she used GTEx V7 data and developed um, this approach. And this is really the key of it. So you, you assign expression level to the various transcripts. So this one is lowly expressed, this one's highly expressed, and this one's kind of intermediate. And then if you had a variant here, well, it's only in one of the transcripts, that happens to be the lowly expressed. And so for each position, you add up the expression level of how that exon is used across the different transcripts. And that leads you to a median transcript expression in a GTEx tissue and, and gives you a value. And this is how the data is represented on the NOMAD site. So these are the text scores, the proportion expressed transcript. There's the, it's the blue bar. Sorry, I'll turn off there. Okay, it's the blue bar. And so you can see, so this exon's highly expressed, this exon's very lowly expressed. And so when we look at loss of function variants in this gene, you'll see there's a large number of loss of function variants actually right here um, in this, over this kind of, first and second exon. And what it turns out is in some of the transcripts, this is annotated as one large exon, and in some as two small exons. And it looks like the two small exons are the parts that are really expressed. And the ones that are falling here that are protein truncating variants are really intronic in those two transcripts. Um, so, sorry, in these transcripts here. So we think that these are not of biological importance in this context. This, these loss of function variants are falling in this exon here that's not expressed. Um, and then this one here is actually a splice variant. I've looked into this one. Um, and there's a rescue splice variant right upstream that maintains the frame. 
The only ones I can't fully explain are these down here that are in the last exon, but these typically wouldn't be expected to cause nonsense mediated decay, and so I wouldn't necessarily expect them to cause disease. Um, and so in many genes that are haploinsufficient, sufficient we see loss of function in the last exon that doesn't cause biological or doesn't cause disease. Um, however, there are some ClinVar variants down there, so I don't really know what to make of that, and I haven't looked into these ClinVar variants. Um, so for the most part, though, all these loss of function variants we can explain as not, as not having biological impact. And so if you were interested so, you know, Soto syndrome affects the neurodevelopment, and so maybe the brain and is what you wanted to look at, and so you said, well, I don't want to use the mean expression, I really want to look at the actual um, tissue of interest, then you can, you can actually open this up and look at all the different tissues. So this is how we use PEC scores. So this is a variant where it was helpful for us in our rare disease analysis. So the gene is AGAP1, it's a loss of function constrained gene, there's no known disease association. And what we had here was a missense variant with kind of a you know, borderline high CAD score, but the REVEL score, which is one of the meta predictors we really used, was very high, and so that really got our attention. Um, and so we thought like, that, that potentially this could be interesting, reinforced by the fact that this variant is entirely absent from all reference population databases, and even within our internal call set of 10,000 rare disease patients was only seen once additionally. So you know, not seen in the population, moderate to high in silico scores, missense variant and a loss of function constrained gene looked interesting. One next question is always, is it de novo? That obviously gets your attention to a higher level. We don't know. So this is this variant is present in the child, is not present in the mother, and we don't have the, we're unable to get the father's sample, so we just can't say for sure, and we get stuck like that on, on a lot of cases. Um, and so this was a candidate for a while, but then someone went and looked it up in Nomad, and this variant actually falls in this exon here that is not um, expressed in most of the, the trend, is not really expressed, and so that really lowered our interest in this. Um, and for us, like, you know, it's, like, I can't say for sure, um, there's some caveats, but it made it much less interesting candidate for us. The caveats are that this is adult tissue, and so it's possible that it has some important role in development that we weren't appreciating. Um, so it would be really great if we had like a GTEx that had fetal and more pediatric tissues, um, but this is what we have for the time being. Um, and not for the example I showed you, but very large genes, we do see a little, we see we have, the method has more trouble correcting for the, the decay you see from the three prime end, so um, that, can, that can be a factor, and you'll, you'll see the pattern on the PEC scores, and so you just kind of maybe pay a little attention to that. Um, and then there have been some issues with non-coding transcript impacting the PEC scores, and, and Brill had worked to um, improve the method, and we're trying to actually flag genes where we think that's more of an issue where you may not want to rely as much on the PEC scores. But for a lot of genes, this method works really well. That's this patient. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So if it, yeah. So if there was an, I know. So if it says two, then we're very interested in who that other person is. But yes. Yeah. So if you only have one parent, can you look at the extended haplotype around the variant? I mean, my guess is. So my guess is that this is just. So we've talked about doing that in other cases. Most de novo variants are occurring on the paternal haplotype. So, but I mean, in most studies, like close to 80% of them do. So, proving it's on the paternal haplotype doesn't really narrow it down for me. Maybe if it were on the, maybe if I had the father and not the mother, and then I had more like a 20% chance it was on the paternal, maybe then I'd be more interested in, in checking. But yeah, it's it's more most likely on the paternal haplotype, no matter what, given that I don't have the father. Okay, so. Just to get back to variant aggregation and a little bit of future planning, you'll have the whole next session to hear about the, the larger vision of NOMAD. Um, but overall, as Elizabeth asked me, there is a large overlap in samples between NOMAD V2, it's the 15,000 genomes and 125,000 exomes, and NOMAD V3. Right now, you can't actually tell about the overlap. Um, they're, they're on different builds, so we have been using them a little bit independently. We actually personally are using our, the exomes and, yeah, so, but there is overlap. We're working on making a subset so you can say which ones are not in Nomad V2, the same way that we have subsets to say which aren't in TopMed, because that's another database that we use as a reference. Um, so that's coming, but we don't have it yet. Um, and then, 
I just wanted to show you Nomad V3. It looks very similar to Nomad V2. The exon coverage is gone because we don't have any exome data in here. And so you just see this, like, really um, what the genome data looks like on its own. Again, this really great coverage across GC content. The other reason, the other way I actually kind of use this is um, if I have a gene that I have a structural variant in um, from a different data set, I'll often come here and look at Nomad to see what the mapping data looks like over the region. I know we can, t there's mapping tracks on UCSC, and I use those also. But there are actually some genes in Nomad that, like the, that have almost no coverage in the genome data, meaning we just cannot map to it um, with short read data anyway. And so that's very helpful. So sometimes you do have something that looks like a structural variant from, particularly if you're trying to call them from like exome or genome data, but then when you come and look at Nomad, you can see how difficult that region is to assemble, and that kind of downweights my, the likelihood that that is a real structural variant that's been called. But, um, so. So if I if I have a like if I have a coordinates that I'm like oh this structural this the structural variant was called we typically in my case it happens off of exome data we do a lot of uh, C and B calling off of exome data and I'll sometimes have a coordinate of that covers like part of a gene and so I'll look up that gene in Nomad just to see what the coverage looks like and it might be that that gene is really poorly covered in Nomad and if it's poorly covered in exome data that's a little bit concerning but if it's poorly covered in genome data like we just cannot map like the like as a field, like we, it just, you can't map to that region with short read data. And so I just don't trust a structural variant in that region the same way. Obviously array data is different, but like for, for, for short read data, it's, I think it's a really helpful sense of like how easy it is to map data to it. Uh, great. So then the last thing I just wanted to mention is that we, all of this data is downloadable. You can access it through the downloads page. Um, we also have a publications page where you can access all the publications from the NOMAD data set. Um, and so you can go in and you can, um, the constraint metrics for the whole gene are downloadable in an Excel file. Um, this, all the, the variants are downloadable in like, as you can see, very, very large files that you probably aren't, aren't going to be running on your computer, but you can use in pipelines. Um, and so one of the other points I wanted to make is sometimes people, we store the exome and the genome data separately for Nomad V2 because they're separate call sets that we then merge in some of the analysis. Um, but if you were to say, oh, I want to look at everything, sometimes people download just the genome data because they want to look at coding and non-coding. But what you're really downloading when you do that is only 15, data from 15,000 genomes, and you're not getting the 125,000 exomes. So you want to be using both data sets if you want to look at everything. And then I just wanted to acknowledge the um, large and fantastic team that works on this data set. You'll be hearing from more next. Obviously, all this started by Daniel MacArthur, um, but now Mark Daly and Heidi Reen really taking the, the lead on continuing the, the Nomad as, continuing Nomad as a, a resource for the community. Um, and then while I take questions, I just thought I would leave this up here with all the recent papers that have been covered a lot here, um, along with some hyperlinks to them for anyone who wants to get into the science of Nomad more. Great. <laughs> Happy to take any other nomad related questions. Yes, Elizabeth. You talked a lot about looking for coding mutations. Can you address a little bit um, the use of how, how to approach non coding with this and making sure that you're covering entire regions so that, because if you're gene centric, you obviously aren't going out into the non coding region far enough? Right. So that's one of the great things about having the whole genome, the V3 data set, is you can really look into variation in the non coding regions now. We don't have any tools to like tell you where in the non which non coding variants are more interesting versus less interesting. It's been worked on to develop non coding constraint, but it's been more challenging than for the coding constraint. In large part, because mutation rates do seem to vary, like it's well known, mutation rates vary across the genome based on replication timing and a number of other factors that seem to not be as much of an issue in the coding. There doesn't seem to be as much variation in the coding regions for mutation rates. So we don't have any good tips for that yet, um, but the variants are there. Ah, yeah, so we've talked about um, whether we should add more conservation support into Nomad, and that's, I think, one of the topics that will come up in the next session where we're going to be getting user input into what features are the most important to have. Um, so that's, that's come up, but no one's really pressed strongly for it, so you'll have your opportunity. Great. Thank you.